Ryan, I think you have something on your radar. What is it? Uh, I might. So on Sunday, Senator Bernie Sanders will visit workers at a Staten Island warehouse that will vote soon on whether or not to join their comrades across the street in organizing into a union. Now, their victory earlier this month shocked the corporate world, which is also watching the organizing at Starbucks awfully closely. And while Democrats have been face planting in Congress, the Amazon victory by a ragtag crew with just $120,000 from GoFundMe has raised the question of what value there really is in electoral politics. Should people just focus on building power for a base of working people instead and abandon the duopoly? So a closer look at how Chris Smalls and his allies put this win together and are threatening to win again soon shows that you actually can't have one without the other, or at least the two very much work together, not as an either or. Now, one of Biden's most aggressive appointments as president was naming, was naming Jennifer Abruzzo as general counsel of the National Labor Relations Board. She might be the only person that bothers the Wall Street Journal editorial board more than Lena Khan. In December, under pressure, Amazon agreed to a critical settlement with the NLRB in which they agreed to allow workers to organize inside their facilities, just not on the immediate shop floor. President Trump and the MAGA movement talks a huge game about being pro-worker, and when it comes to a lot of workers' cultural grievances, they're definitely on their side. But when it comes to their material and economic interests in the form of unionizing, they're nowhere to be seen. Trump's NLRB absolutely would not have reached this settlement with Amazon. So let's take a look at how Smalls and his team pulled this off. So friend of the show, Jordan Cheriton of Status Quo, an independent news outlet well worth supporting, interviewed Smalls at the warehouse a number of times, and he explained it like this. They try to install that fear to these workers. They try to tell them that they talk to us. Uh, they'll get fired. Uh, they spread rumors. They don't stop the rumors. The rumors spread about union dues or about talking to us, getting fired or, or retaliation. Uh, they don't stop that. But the difference is this is completely worker led. These workers that are in the inside, they get all that information real time. And that right there uh, has been a huge success for us. Everything they've been doing that's been doubling down on the workers has been backfiring because they see the difference. They see the visibility and why we're out here uh, compared to what they're telling them in the building. Now in Bessemer, Alabama, Amazon hired, hired union busters who would walk the shop floor and talk to workers, telling them how awful unions are. In Staten Island, workers were able to fight back by exposing them. As HuffPost reported, they created flyers identifying the most prolific union busters in the warehouse, listing where they're based, typically far away, and how much money they had earned on union busting campaigns. They would put stacks of the flyers in break rooms throughout the facility so everyone would see them and know how much Amazon was spending to fly anti-union consultants in from around the country. So Connor Spence, an Amazon worker, told Dave Jamison he would follow consultants around the warehouse, handing workers copies of their Labor Department filings that showed their $300 per hour fees. That was, extremely, that was an extremely powerful tactic, he said. If it was worth it to Amazon to pay somebody that much to convince workers not to join a union, the union must be pretty powerful. Spence also told Jameson that there was one extremely effective female consultant who would chat up the male, co the male workers. Quote, all the guys in her department were in love with her, I said. So the men defended her when union organizers called her out as a union buster. But when they produced copies of her disclosure filings showing she had made nearly $20,000 for just one week of union busting, the dudes felt betrayed. Now, outside the warehouse, the Smalls crew set up tents where they'd feed workers lunch, help them with any issues they were having, talk shop, hang out, and even share weed. Amazon complained to the NLRB about the free pot, but their lawyer defended it as no different than passing out t-shirts, at least as far as labor law was concerned. Now, without that work inside the warehouse and without all the organizing in that tent outside the warehouse, there's simply no way they could have successfully organized the union. And without the NLRB forcing Amazon to allow that organizing to take place without calling the police, although they did call the police on Smalls once, that organizing wouldn't have been able to happen. Now, none of this would surprise, for instance, Eugene Debs, the legendary Gilded Age railroad union organizer, uh, or helped organize the massive worker uprisings from the 1870s to 1890s, which were ruthlessly crushed, not just by bosses, but by bosses working hand in hand with National Guard troops and police forces. Only with the New Deal did the state become either neutral or supportive of union organizing. 
1936, when Ford workers engaged in a sit-down strike, the company appealed to the federal government to help them break the strike. FDR told Ford that it was their problem and to go work it out themselves. FDR didn't help, but by not crushing the workers, he gave them the chance to win, and they did. In the 1980s, that reversed, with President Reagan actively siding with companies to crush unions. So it's not that electing Democrats today magically brings about a union movement or will get your own workplace unionized. But what it did here was give the workers a fair shot. Because if you can't be in the break room and you can't pass the flyers out, if you can't follow the union busters around and hand out the flyers, they just have a completely free hand. Yeah, you're raising a really, I think, important point for the right to listen to. Um, <laughs> and it's because, so uh, in fairness, a lot happened between FDR and Reagan. A lot mm -hmm. happened in the economy and a lot happened with workers and with corporations and law and all of that. And I think that's why, as I wrote in The Federalist last week, you have a lot of people caught between big labor and big business, both of which are corrupt, in corrupt institutions that are not always don't, do not always have workers' best interests in hand. And so on the right, Smalls was on Tucker's show. I wrote mm -hmm. this long piece in The Federalist about why conservatives should support the union. Um, and it, there's some sort of like flirtation with the idea that, you know, th this is Amazon is a huge employer. There are a lot of people whose, as you say, material interests are on the line. This is not an mm -hmm. abstract intellectual debate. They have a horrible safety record that is, is mm -hmm. way worse than their competitors. People are, people's existence and livelihoods are on the line immediately. And so what happens is you need a way for the sort of this to trickle from you know, the conservative talkers into actual mm -hmm. action. And I had Matt Stoller on Federalist Radio Hour this week to talk about this in terms of antitrust. And he made such an interesting point. He was like, if Donald Trump was in charge of, you know, it, like you don't have Lena Khan under mm -hmm. Donald Trump. And so like the Republican Party and conservatives might want to talk about unions. But until that translates into the bureaucratic infrastructure of like the NLRB, right. You are. Um, you, you could actually be just talking and then undercutting the interests that you're talking right. about, even even if you think politically right. it's best. Right, because like the right, the, the current MAGA movement has kind of gone ahead of itself so hard mm -hmm. that it's still that still the NLRB types are just Reagan era lawyers who just are in there to to bust the union. But you're right. The the independent nature of the of the Smalls crew was, yes. was key to this. It was big labor, which tried to organize. Bessemer, first of all, they didn't even go door to door yep. because they were worried about COVID. Mm -hmm. So they're just texting workers. Mm -hmm. Not surprising that you know they, that they got hammered there. And it's one thing to have access to a break room, but if you don't work there, you don't have access to the break room. So what Smalls had mm -hmm. is allies. I mean, he worked for the uh, warehouse for five years. He helped set it up. He hired a lot of the people you know who are who are currently there. So he knows all these people going in and out. And so. Their organizers are actual organic workers, not organizers who manage to like trick their way into getting a job inside the warehouse to then organize it from the inside. Which, if if you do that, good for you. Good, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> you can try it. It's it's just it just feels more natural. Well, and like it's nobody's going to mistake Chris Smalls for like a, a a big labor suit who's kind of sneaking his way in there, and so that that gives them access to the break room. And it's the NLRB that says no, you have to give them access to this break room. And if you don't, uh, we're, we're coming at you, we're suing you, we're coming at you, you broke your agreement, etc. And that's also why this independent format, you know, the, I've, I've talked to sort of experts uh, about this question. They say, yes, the independent, you, you lose a lot of resources um, that big labor legitimately has mm -hmm. when you go the independent route. But at the same time, the benefit, in addition to being sort of leaner and all of that, is that Chris Smalls actually represents the interest of the workers. And you don't have, as you say, a suit sort of flying in from DC um, who is telling workers what their interests are right. instead of having workers say what their interests right. are. You're cutting out um, a, an often corrupt and unhelpful middleman. And the argument that they often made in Bessemer is like, look, all, all these union dues are just going to pay these huge salaries of these union executives and these union bosses who live in Washington, D.C. and have these giant buildings and these mansions. And you're like, well, every organization needs administrative. You can make that argument and you can push back. But if you're saying that all of the union dues are going to go to ALU, mm -hmm. this little smalls organization, which is out there already get, making lunch for you, mm -hmm. handing out weed, mm -hmm. you're like, okay, that's mm -hmm. fine. 
Like that, because then you feel like you're paying dues into an organization that genuinely represents you. Exactly, exactly. And again, this is just, that's why this is a big lesson, I think, particularly for the right. Nobody's asking you to support the, you know, this is not the teacher's union. This is, that's not what this is. And people's material interests, many, many people's material interests are on the line. Their safety is on the line. Um, it's time to move this from sort of the abstract conversation into actually figuring out who you're going, what you're going to do in a new Congress and who's going to be taking up those personnel as policy yeah. positions. I think as long as Mitch McConnell is oh, running, yeah. the, running the Senate, it's going to be the old school. You're right. And, you know. Yeah, there's no question about that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, looking forward to what's on your radar up next.